Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming is sponsored by Awake Us Now. And now here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. Today we continue in our series, Rescued by Truth, and we also continue, as we've been doing for the last few weeks, taking a look at the story of the Exodus. And today, the most tragic part of that story, a story of rebellion, of apostasy, a story of people falling from the living God, but a story that has dramatic application to your life and to mine. And so as we begin this morning, I'd like to begin once again with truth number one. We keep circling back to that, but it is a powerful and important truth. And that is that God's word speaks to my generation, to your generation. It is a word that is a living word. It has dynamic power to change, to transform, and to renew us. When we hear and heed that word, we are blessed. When we ignore that word, we invite sorrow, difficulty, and pain into our lives. And if ever there were an account from the scripture that illustrates what happens when people turn away from that word, it's the one we're going to study here this morning. I'd invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. And over these uh, last few weeks, we have been talking about the very real possibility that this mountain in Arabia, in the the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Jab Arabia Jabal al-Makla, is quite possibly the real Mount Sinai. There is certainly scriptural evidence. There is also evidence from history and evidence from geography. But there are also some very fascinating coincidences near this mountain. What we are told in Exodus chapter 32 is this. Moses had uh, gone up to the mountain earlier, and in chapter 24, we read that when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. We talked about the fact that Moses had also gone to the foot of the mountain where sacrifices were offered and blood was sprinkled both on the altar and on the representatives of the people. And then Moses, as we are told in the following verses, goes up on the mountain and he spends 40 days and 40 nights. And it's there we pick up with the story in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32 verse 1 says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Those words are dripping with disgust. Moses was the one who brought us out of Egypt, they say, not God. And not only that, they say, make us some gods who will take us back to Egypt. They want to return to slavery. The very individuals who less than two months earlier had said, everything the Lord has said we will do, now violate the first commandment, no other gods, violate the following commandments by making idols and worshiping other gods. And in addition to that, as we will see, they go even one step further. Now, Aaron, in his defense, tries to slow this down. And what we read in Exodus chapter 32 is that Aaron answered them and said, Take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. What Aaron may have been thinking is if they have to give up their riches, maybe they'll stop this. But they didn't. And neither did Aaron. Instead, we read as follows, Aaron took what they had handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. And again, it appears that Aaron is doing everything in his power to kind of change the narrative here. But the fact is, they've still made an idol and they're still going to worship. And we read then in verses 5 and 6, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf, announced tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early 
Do you notice that? They even got up early. They weren't going to sleep in. They had all sorts of things planned for this day. And they sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. The Hebrew that is used here is a euphemism. It's basically saying they had an orgy. And dear friends, what we see here has dramatic application to our own day. Because you see, when people create their own gods, they also create their own rules. And that is precisely what takes place now. The Israelites had already thrown out the first commandment, no other gods. They had already gone against the teaching, make no graven image for worship. And now they basically say, and the rest of the covenant law that we said we would keep, we're going to throw it out and we're going to party. And uh, that is indeed what took place. One of the things that I find especially fascinating about this mountain in Saudi Arabia is the circumstantial evidence that surrounds it including for this. Because you see, at the foot of the mountain, there is what appears to be the remains of an altar, like the one that Moses used as he consecrated the people. But there is something else. Right in the midst of this gigantic plain where the Israelites may well have settled down for months. And what we see there is this. It's fenced off because it's an archaeological treasure much work remains to be done. But this particular huge stone structure is right in the shadow of Jabal al-Makla, the possible Mount Sinai. And that huge stone structure, which you can kind of gather how big it is just from this photograph that shows you a full-size man standing on top of it. This huge stone structure also has some rather interesting artwork on it because on that structure there are numerous petroglyphs carved rock, rock carvings actually uh, of bulls and cows and uh, they they certainly are reminiscent of the worship of the Israelites for the golden calf but more than that as we read in Exodus 32 verses 7 and 8 at this point, as they are engaging in an orgy of false worship, we read, Then the Lord said to Moses, chapter 32, verses 7 and 8, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them, and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And by the way, in the area around this huge stone structure, there's also what is almost like a, uh, an ancient billboard. It has pictures of cattle, but among the pictures are some like this an individual below the calf with arms uplifted. It is a symbol that was used widely by the ancient Egyptians for the worship of calves and bulls, for the Apis worship and the Horus worship. And when you look at that, it really brings to mind the very things the Israelites did. There's something else that's seen here in this, this image, by the way, or the images that surround it, I should say. And it does seem to be depicting an orgy. Um, we won't show those pictures, but it, it's there. And, and it reminds us of what the Israelites were doing and how God intervened and tells Moses after 40 days on the mountain, this is what they've done. You need to go down. And Moses does just that. Chapter 32, verses 25 and 26. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Moses had confronted Aaron in chapter 32 and asked him, Why did he do this? And Aaron said, Well, I threw the gold in the fire and out popped a calf. 
one of the flimsiest, childish, most childish kind of excuses imaginable. But now Moses realizes this must stop. And so the Levites rally to him. And then we read these words, chapter 32, verse 28. The Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day, about 3,000 of the people died. Now, there is a tragic consequence to disobedience here. But there is also a question. And the question is this. What happened to the 3,000 who died? And the answer, well, they would have been buried, right? And knowing what we know about Israelite practices, where would they have been buried? They wouldn't have buried them in the middle of the camp. They'd have buried them outside the camp. Now, the site that we've been looking at for these last few weeks is located and has been located for centuries in the middle of nowhere. That's going to change as a modern city is built all around this. But it has been out in the boondocks for centuries. Yet just a few miles from the huge plain where two to three million Israelites could have camped out, there is this. It too is marked off as an archaeological site. It is an ancient graveyard. It covers acres. And in that ancient graveyard, you see hundreds of these matseva, a standing stone. The ancient Israelites used standing stones to mark significant events, significant promises, but also to mark graves. And here in this massive graveyard, you find truly hundreds of these standing stones. Just to give you an idea, pictures of them, many still standing, others that have fallen over. But again, this is far removed from ancient civilization. This is out in the middle of nowhere, and you have hundreds, thousands of graves. They've yet to be explored and dug up. I would imagine some fascinating things will be found when that takes place. What we know from the scripture is that 3,000 died in a day and would have been buried not far from the camp. And that is precisely what we see here. And it reminds us that these things, whether this is the actual site or not, remains to be seen. But it's certainly a reminder that these things happened that this really did take place in human history. And with it is a sign of God's faithfulness in spite of people's unfaithfulness. With it is a sign that God is to be taken seriously in your life and in mine. We need to hear and to heed his word. We need to learn of him and from him. And here in Exodus 32, we also see a picture of what is to come. Not simply of standing stones, the graves of the 3,000, but also this, Exodus 32, verses 31 and 32. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They've made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. I would like to suggest here that we see in Moses prophetic foreshadowing of the Messiah to come. Let me illustrate that if I may. First of all, what do we see of Moses here in Exodus 32? At the very outset, verses 9 to 14, we see Moses' humility. God tells Moses what the Israelites have done. They've made an idol and are worshiping it. And then God says to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out and I will make a nation out of you. And Moses turns him down. Moses has a heart for God's truth and a heart for God's character and a heart for God's word. And he says, no, Lord, if you do this, you've made a promise. They're your people. Not only that, but your enemies will laugh at this and ridicule your name. 
And in addition to that, Lord, in addition, remember the promises you've made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And as Moses speaks those words, he is showing godly humility, the kind of humility we see in our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Apostle Paul said, even though he was in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and became obedient unto death. Moses shows godly humility, the kind of humility that will be seen in full in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moses shows something else, and that is the importance of atonement. In chapter 32, verse 30, Moses says to the Israelites, he will talk to God and try to bring about atonement for their sins. Our Lord Jesus is the one who brings atonement, who re reconciles us to God, who reestablishes the relationship and does that by his own sacrificial death. Moses is already a picture of a greater reality to come. And finally, in Moses, we also see self-sacrifice. Those words from verse 32 that are absolutely chilling. Lord, forgive their sins, and if you don't forgive them, then blot me out of your book of life. He is willing to give himself totally for God's people. And in a far greater sense, our Lord Jesus did just that. He emptied himself and became obedient to death. He sacrificed himself as the full payment for our sin. What we find here in Exodus 32 is not simply a true and accurate statement of what took place some 34, 3500 years ago. What we also see here is a prophetic picture of what is to come. One like Moses, only more so. One who is the very image of the invisible God. The one who is the word made flesh. The one who offers life and forgiveness to all who believe. The one who calls all people everywhere to repent and to come back to God and receive the atonement, the forgiveness, the life that only he can provide. In Moses, we already see a picture of that. And as we've looked at photographs as the possible of the possible site of these events, it reminds us that what we have here is a preview, a picture of what was to come. And it's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is at the heart of the scriptures and who is the very heart of God. And that is why the author of Hebrews wrote these words. Hebrews 9, verses 27 and 28 he said, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, the Israelites faced judgment that very day out in the wilderness. All of us will someday stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the author of Hebrews says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. His sacrifice covers your sin and mine. His sacrifice brings forgiveness and life, joy and peace. His sacrifice is the very heart of the scriptures. It is the thing that is pictured and prophesied here in Exodus 32. And so... He who was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The stories of Scripture are the very narratives of God, and they call us to recognize there is more to life than what we experience here and now. Life will not end for all who believe. And that is why our Lord Jesus calls us, you and me, to turn to him, to turn to the one who has always kept his word. Human beings have broken their promises. God never breaks his. And the promise is to all who repent and believe the good news of Christ, we will live forever. We will be raised at the last day. That's what the author of Hebrews talks about. He's coming back, and it reminds us that nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important than knowing the living God, following Him, trusting Him, 
and obeying him. True faith shows itself in radical obedience. And that is what God is calling his people to today, in these last days, that we may be like a bride ready for the wedding feast to come. May God grant that reality in your life and in mine for Jesus' sake. Amen. Would you join with me, please, in a word of prayer? Lord our God, how we praise you for your goodness and faithfulness. Although people break their promises, you have never and will never break yours. We thank you for the promise of life that is ours in Christ. We thank you for the promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit whom you have poured out on all of us who believe. And we thank you for the promise that we will be raised, that there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. May that, Lord, be at the heart of our lives, the heart of our faith, the heart of our obedience. Amen. Let's talk about these things, shall we? And not just the pictures. Let's, for instance, discuss the following. When people create their own gods, they also create their own rules. How's this demonstrated in the golden calf incident? And how is it evident today? And what does that say to each of us? What does that say to our culture and the day and age in which we find ourselves? And how should that call us to live? And then discuss how Moses serves as a picture of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. The law, John tells us, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How does Moses serve as a picture of the Messiah who was to come and has come and is coming back? On that note, I would invite you, if you haven't yet done so, to check out our website, awakeusnow.com. But we are going to take this time now to receive from God the Lord's Supper, uh, something we do every week. It is. It is a visible, tangible reminder of what God has done. It is even more than that. It is, in a way beyond our ability to comprehend, the body and blood of the one who gave himself up for us all. This is what we read in the scriptures. Our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had broken it and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat, my dear friends. This is the body of Christ offered up for you and for me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, All of you drink of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ, freely shed for you and for me. And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Strengthen us and preserve us in the faith until that glorious day when he comes back. May each of us be filled with his joy, his abiding peace, and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, my dear friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. If you are asking yourself, now what? 
We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.